I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Ivan Butkovic. Uh, he is uh, at the moment employed at the Mayo Clinics uh, in Metabolomics Group, uh, works together with Professor Matsura and Jaya, and uh, he has been working at Mayo since uh, 2015. Uh, Dr. Ivan graduated from chemistry at the University of Belgrade, and he also um, obtained a PhD over there under the guidance of Professor Milos Savlevic. He worked in the field of um, structural determination of natural products. I'm sorry for that, okay? So he's, um, can you hear me? I can. I, I had some microphony from the other channel, so I'm sorry. And uh, then he, uh, in 2009, started working as a teaching assistant at the Faculty of Chemistry. In 2014, uh, he was promoted to assistant professor, and he uh, teached structural instrumental methods in chemistry of secondary metabolites. He also had uh, two postdocs, that he finished in University of Helsinki and also in uh, uh, Finland, right? And afterwards, he started his PhD, uh, postdoc into 15 in Mayo and since to 17 works over there. So he um, likes a lot NMR, targeted and untargeted NMR prophylactobiological samples, blood, urine, saliva, cell, and tissue. And today he's going to tell us something about NMR in urine analysis. So, even please be my guest. Hvala, Ljubice. Nema na čemu. Both Ljubice and I are alumni of Belgrade University. We come from the same country originally. And uh, I want to send greetings to Belgrade and Serbia, and I hope that there are a few participants from there as well. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. I hope you can see it now. Can you try to share it? Yep. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, your screen is on. All is good, you can start. Okay, so the topic of today's talk is NMR-based during metabolomics. Uh, as I said, I'm not a great fan of webinars, but uh, this is the only way now to communicate over such a great distance. There's more than 8,000 kilometers between us right now, and Google Flight says that it would take uh, almost a whole day to to get there. Uh, as Ljubica mentioned, I'm currently in Rochester, far up north, and I'm sending you warm regards. It may sound as, as a joke, uh, because usually the weather would be very cold this time of the year. Uh, currently it's not, but uh, we had the first snow uh, almost a month ago, these photos were taken in, in downtown campus of uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester in 25th October this year. Uh, that's where the Mayo headquarters is, but Mayo has multiple sites besides Rochester, Minnesota and surrounding area. There are hospitals and uh, research facilities in Arizona and Florida. 
In total, Mayo Clinic has more than 65,000 employees and is repeatedly voted as number one clinic in the United States. Uh, those three shields of Mayo Clinic, they don't represent these three sites. They actually represent patient care uh, as the major one. And then two additional ones are education and research and Mayo Clinic pays a lot of attention to research. They uh, understood very early that investing in research actually can make Mayo Clinic thrive and uh, become one of the best clinics in the world. So today there's over 4,000 people uh, working in research exclusively at, at Mayo Clinic and a lot of clinicians, physicians, they are actively participate in research area. So Mayo represents a unique place where physicians and, and, and scientists can come together, communicate, exchange information. And this is actually a very fertile soil for metabolomics field where we can uh, get a lot of well-defined samples from clinics and use modern methods to analyze them and then apply statistical methods to find some patterns and answer uh, biological questions. Uh, this is a brief outline on, of today's talk. I will uh, use a couple of slides for very brief metabolomics introduction. I believe many, most of you actually uh, are familiar with uh, this discipline. Then I will talk about particular projects and problems that we were solving here at Mayo that include kidney stones, uh, regular kidney stones. Then there's a group of rare kidney stones where at Mayo, we have uh, a, a repository of a uh, large number of, of, of samples that belong to this group. At in the end, I will just briefly went through another project that is focused on polycystic kidney disease. And hopefully we will have some time left for question answer section. Uh, the term metabolomics is relatively new and it was first mentioned at the beginning of this millennia, millennium uh, where two godfathers of the field gave their definitions of metabolomics. So even though the discipline is new, the, the, the concept itself is very old. Uh, it is known that in ancient China, physicians used uh, patient urine and ants to diagnose disease that we now know as diabetes. So urine from the patients with diabetes contains glucose and ants like sugar, so they will, will be attracted to it. If they don't care about the urine, then you are good, you are not sick. Uh, the techniques have been improved in the meantime, and this is a so-called urine wheel from a book published in Middle Ages, uh, where different properties of urine, such as color, smell, and taste, were associated with specific diseases. You can think of metabolomics as a simple biochemical blood test. So you are measuring some biochemically relevant parameters of the blood, uh, such as glucose, and uh, then you use data from other patients to define reference ranges, which should be acceptable. And if some values are outstanding, that information can be 
indicator of presence of a specific disease. So when we talk about techniques that we now use in metabolomics, most widespread are NMR and mass spectrometry methods like liquid and gas chromatography uh, combination with, with mass spectrometry and uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, less used are uh, electrophoresis and, and infrared spectroscopy. When we talk about samples, they can be virtually anything. Most widely used are blood as such, or blood produced plasma or serum, uh, urine, cerebrospinal fluid. You can prepare different tissue or cell extracts. You can use cell culture media. You can use saliva, like cell bread condensate. Uh, but today we will focus on NMR as a technique and urine as a sample just to have more focused discussion. So at NMR Metabolomic Score facility, we have a couple of instruments that we can use. Uh, those would be 500 and 700 broker instruments, but the one that we mostly use for metabolomic investigations is this one at 600, which has this sample jet that can carry out more than 500 samples at a time. And it has Bruker IVDR platform, which is uh, abbreviation of in vitro diagnostics. So it is standardized platform for clinical screening. And uh, that means that you prepare samples according to well-defined and established Bruker protocols. You run the samples, uh, the same way, and then the spectra are automatically uploaded to Bruker server uh, where they are processed and reports are created, and then reports are sent back to, to you in a matter of minutes virtually. So it's very convenient, uh, but it has its limitations, and I will be talking about that a little bit later. When we talk about urine, uh, it is uh, one of the favorite uh, mediums used in, in metabolomic investigations. Uh, you can obtain urine in high amounts, uh, non-invasively. It is sterile. Uh, sample preparation for NMR is very simple. And uh, the spectra that you get from urine is informative because it contains a large number of metabolites that are biologically relevant. So uh, the sample preparation is indeed very simple. By Brooker protocol, you can start with 900 microliters of urine, then you add buffer that contains uh, phosphate uh, buffer at pH 7.4, 10% uh, uh, actually it's all in D2O. So when you mix urine with this buffer, you have roughly 10, you have 10 of, of D2O in, in your NMR sample. And then it contains TSP as internal standard. You vortex this, mixture for 20 seconds, then you spin it down for five minutes and you collect supernatant if there is any pellet there. Then you transfer that to NMR tube and NMR tube goes to the NMR instrument. And this is how the typical NMR spectrum of human urine at 600 megahertz look like. So this is regular uh, male in his 40s. We can call him 
Fulano de Tal, I believe in Portuguese. And uh, some of you that have been seeing NMR spectra before may recognize some features of this spectrum, such as reference peak of TSP at zero ppm and the most abundant component in urine, which is creatinine. It has two peaks that originate from CH2 and CH3 group of this molecule. And we can do integration of this spectrum. And you can see that the integral ratio between two peaks of creatinine is roughly two to three, which reflects the ratio of, of protons in this compound. And then you can compare it to the integral of TSP peak. And uh, from that, you can calculate the concentration of creatinine in your sample. So this is the basis of quantitative NMR. And you can use it for any component in urine that you can identify. But uh, if you do it manually, that will be a very time consuming process, even for a single spectrum. In metabolomics, you always use many uh, samples and you need to analyze many spectra. So that's not the best way to go. Uh, some procedures for automatic analysis of the spectra where they are all based uh, uh, at the same principle of quantitative NMR. So you identify peak, you measure its intensity and compare it to, to known standard. So I'm zooming into aromatic region of this spectrum. You can go line by line, peak by peak, try to identify that component and measure its integral, integral against the standard and you can get its concentration. So Brooker developed its own protocol and uh, it can measure up to 50 components uh, in, in, in a single sample at once. And uh, it also can give you reference ranges for normal ranges based on 95% range, statistical range for all the spectra that they have uh, analyzed so far. Uh, this is very convenient, but unfortunately it has limited uh, uh, use in NMR because when you combine all the reports, you can see that many values are missing. Uh, that's because the broker set very high bar for uh, sample ID and peak fitting. So many of the metabolites are actually missed from, from a Brooker report. And in that way, the information that you have in your NMR spectrum uh, is, is lost. So if you wanna apply statistical analysis on, on data set like this one, uh, you can see that for creatinine, you have all the values, but for dimethylamine, there are a lot of values missing for for oil glycine uh, among these 30 samples that I used as, as, as an example, uh, Brooker didn't find or didn't quantify this component in any of them. So there should be a better way to analyze the data. One of the way that we use and it's uh, spreading in metabolomics community is use of genomics software. Uh, I'm using again the same uh, aromatic region expansion of, of the human urine spectrum. Uh, you upload the spectrum in genomics software and over there there are there is a library of something over 300 metabolites that you can also integrate HMD, HMDB uh, NMR database and use those compounds. Uh, and uh, then you can use peak fitting to get concentrations of metabolites that you can identify in the spectrum. So you can just 
type specific component and it will uh, try to fit its spectrum into experimental spectrum of the sample that you have uh, recorded or you can just click over the, the, the specific peak and you can search all the components that might have peaks around that area and then you try to fit them. So if you know what these peaks are, for example, these three peaks in the middle, I know that I can attribute them to hippuric acid and if I try to fit hippuric acid, the software will do it very efficiently and accurately and you can actually do it in automation mode but if you rely just on in automation mode it actually won't do much better job than than broker software itself so canomex has advantage that it is interactive and you can uh do adjustments by by yourself so for the next two peaks uh in this spectrum uh, there is no compound matching if you try to fit phenylacetylglycine automatically you see that you come out short manually you can adjust this peak and it might work and uh, if you continue for every peak in the spectrum and try to adjust it manually you can get much better result the limitation is uh, that the process is very time consuming and it requires highly trained and experienced people to perform that. So when you export the data from profile spectra uh, in Kenomics, you can get data table like this and you can see for furoid glycine, there are a lot of values there profiled. And for other components, most of them have been profiled in all of your samples and that is nice data set that you can use uh, later in statistical analysis but as i mentioned the problem with this is uh, that it is time consuming and uh, uh, there is another way to handle the spectra uh, in less time consuming way while still uh keeping a lot of information from from nmr spectrum and that process is called binning uh again i hope that many of you are familiar with this so uh this is our high resolution nmr spectrum which is defined by 64 k points and its resolution is 0.25 hertz uh, in binning we can cut this spectrum in pieces and measure the area of each part and uh, plot them that way. Uh, we can define the, the, the width of these areas and uh, you can choose wider or more narrow range for, for this pin or, or bucket. Uh, if you use more narrow, actually loses less resolution but uh, because of peak drifting and peak overlapping uh, it may get um, confounding results uh, if you open bins too wide then two or more peaks can end up in the same bin and you lose a lot of resolution from the spectrum so the compromise would be using the bin width of 0.04 ppm at 600 megahertz that's equivalent of 24 hertz so we have lost the resolution in this way but as you can see by comparing these two spectra a lot of information over there is uh, retained and uh, in this way you get much simpler data set now each spectrum can be uh, described by two properties, one is bin position, the other is bin intensity, and that's something that statistics can handle very well later. Uh, of course, there are problems with this approach as well. I'll try to illustrate some and uh, to show you how we handle this. 
Uh, this is part of the spectrum which shows peaks of dimethylamine and citric acid. And if you look at one spectrum, it's very nice and straightforward. But if you plot, uh, in this case, 35 during spectral overlay, uh, this is actually stack plot, not overlay. Uh, but you can see that peaks are drifting. And if you apply equidistant binning uh, of 0.04 ppm in this case, you can uh, see that peaks of the same compound end up in different bins. And what is even worse, the peaks of two compounds end up in the same bin. And that's uh, a problem with this approach, which can be solved with application of so-called smart or custom binning or variable binning where you can define the regions uh, of and, and, and boundaries of, of bins. In this way, you can uh, adjust them in a way to have all the peaks from one compound in, in, in one bin. Uh, and those bins then can be representative of these compounds. Uh, there is a, also a problem with this approach that you need to do it manually. You need to do it very carefully. Uh, and uh, not always it can be done in in perfect way. But uh, if you deal with urine spectra a lot, you can identify a lot of components and figure out the way how you can group them and how you can organize pins. And this is another example, another region, how how we did it here at, at Mayo. And you actually need to do it only once if you keep your uh, sample preparation, sample acquisition methods constant, which we do, then the peaks will be uh, in the same regions all the time. And once you define them, you can use them over and over. And uh, not only that you can define these pins precisely, you can associate them with metabolites. So once you are done with your statistical analysis and you want to report your results to your colleagues uh, from biology or, or medical area, they, they don't see uh, PPMs, which don't tell them anything. They can also show, associate them with metabolites immediately. So we will show how this works at the example of kidney stones. Uh, we did a large study here at Mayo using regular kidney stones. This is the data table of participants, so we had uh, 454 controls and 576 formers. They are aged and age and sex matched as best as uh, we could. So we had total of over 1000 samples. Uh, I plot here just some of them. This is how the data set would look like, then we would apply our custom or intelligent pinning, and we would end up with a data table which contains uh, 1,300 samples and 214 custom design bins. When we apply PCA analysis on these bins, this is the overview of our samples. Uh, you can see that uh, there is no straightforward separation between the groups, which is, of course, not expected for such a complex problem as uh, kidney stone formers. But PCA also can uh, reveal some outliers, for example, the, the one that is most obvious is this one. And if you 
track the spectrum of this outlier, this is how it looks like. Uh, some of you, Yubitsa for sure, can recognize these peaks, maybe from plasma samples. Uh, this is glucose, and glucose at this concentration should not be should not be present in in urine. If you see it, that's uh, always indication of diabetes. Remember the the end story. So this sample obviously contains something that is far different from others and should be excluded. In this way, you can check other outliers and decide whether you want to uh, include them or exclude them from, from, from data set. And usually from PCA plot, uh, you can uh, find the range where you want to, to exclude uh, outliers. Yeah, so uh, glucose was very concentrated in these samples, so not even Brooker had problem to identify it, and it estimated concentration to 200 millimoles per liter, which is, you can see how much higher of the normal range for, for humans. Okay, so when we remove outliers from our data set, we get much nicer distribution of the of the samples and still there is no indication of very good separation. Uh, PCA is unsupervised method. So even though we, we, we label these samples as formers and controls, the system doesn't take that into account. It looks at uh, all the samples in the same way. Uh, if you apply some of supervised methods to the same data set, such as PLSDA or OPLSDA in this case, you can uh, focus on differences between these two groups. And uh, even though it doesn't look like very nice separation, uh, you can see the trending and you can see that there is, there is some some grouping and some separation between formers and controls. And uh, from this model, we can extract those bins that are responsible for separation between these two groups. And as I mentioned before, we, we can immediately associate these bins to, to metabolize because we, we have defined these bins to fit the peaks of specific metabolites in NMR spectrum. Uh, you can see that a uh, couple of names are growing up uh, more than once. Uh, I hope that does, that doesn't confuse you because one compound can have multiple peaks in NMR. And uh, of course, if one of them is significant, uh, they should have high correlation between each other and then others should be significant as well. So the top metabol the top bin uh, is associated with hippuric acid and you can see that other hippuric acid uh, related bins are also showing up as important. So we are still in process of evaluating these results and trying to put them in biological context, uh, but for me, it was indicative that some of these bins are pointing out to the uh, to the particular metabolites. And most intriguing were these three. Uh, I plot bar graphs of, of bins here, uh, which are total peak area normalized, and. Uh, uh, using t-test, you can see that there's a highly significant statistical difference between controls and stone formers uh, for for the bins associated with these metabolites. All of them can actually uh, show up as Twitter ions in, in the NMR spectrum, and all of these metabolites have been associated uh, 
with uh, consumption of uh, juices, coffee, tea, compounds with uh, uh, that are rich in uh, phenolic com components, uh, and uh, I extracted some information about these components compounds from HMDB, and you can see that uh, tipuric acid is typically increased with increased consumption of phenolic compounds. Proline betaine is biomarker of citrus fruits, and trigonelline is found in different foods in, that include uh, coffee and uh, a plant called Pinot Greek or something like that. So I also found one interesting paper that uh, relates kipuric acid uh, with the kidney stone formation and uh, the authors from Bulgaria show that uh, hippuric acid can be active solvent of calcium oxalate which is type of kidney stone. Uh, as I mentioned before, proline betaine is a marker of citrus consumption. It is well known that uh, drinking lemonade can help eliminating or prevent formation of kidney, kidney stones. But the most interesting is, uh, for me, is trigonaline. Uh, I found a paper from authors in India that showed in vivo in rats that uh, aforementioned plant, which is rich in, in uh, trigonaline, uh, can be used as a therapy for, for, for kidney stones. And they later made a patent that uses extract of this plant uh, as, as, as a cure for, for kidney stones. Uh, I want to mention here that uh, coffee consumption has been associated with lower risk of kidney stone formation. And a lot of people uh, in the past have attributed this to coffee. But there have been studies that show that even decaf coffee can help in, in, in uh, kidney stone treatment. Uh, or preventing formation of kidney stones. Uh, so it's probably not related to caffeine. And uh, taking all these results into account, I would say that trigonaline might be uh, one of compounds that actually can help uh, preventing kidney stone formation. And hopefully we will uh, submit the results of this study for publication by the end of the year. Okay, we are switching to the next topic, uh, which are rare kidney stones. Uh, besides regular kidney stones, there are several types of rare kidney stones. You can see some of them. Here uh, at Mayo, there is a, a consortium of rare kidney stones they collaborate with other uh, sites across the United States and uh, and uh, worldwide. Uh, and uh, we studied some of these rare kidney stones. We got not quite a large number of, of, of them as of now. Uh, they have been uh, classified in four groups and we did some preliminary studies and we found that specifically these cysteine urea stones are separating well from others. At this point, uh, we got in touch with people from Imperial College in London, uh, Matthew Lewis group from there, they exchanged information with us and they said that they have uh, almost 300, 250 cystinuria patients 
and uh, we were wondering if we if we can combine results uh, in, in in a way that we use the raw data acquired at two different sites, something that no one has done before at this scale. So to match the uh, numbers of controls and and uh, cystinuria patients, we used 200 controls from the, the, the previous project. And in order to combine the data, I knew that we have to solve a couple of problems. When I was working on these rare kidney stones from Mayo samples, I uh, noticed that some of them had very specific organic smell. I thought it might be related to some interesting compound, and I compared the spectra of those smelly and normal spectra, and I figured out some peaks that are very, very different. If I combine these peaks on one plot, uh, maybe some of you can get the idea already. So we have five aromatic protons and three protons as a singlet in aliphatic region. So uh, could it be monosubstituted aromatic ring with a metal group? Uh, yes, it's actually toluene. Uh, I ask why we have toluene in the sample. It turns out that toluene is added as preservative to 24-hour urine specimens, especially for cystinuria profile. And I checked with uh, colleagues from nephrology department. They told me, yes, so for some of these patients, toluene has been used for preservation. So I knew that we have to identify beans that are associated with toluene and exclude them from uh, from the data set in order to combine with the data from Imperial College. We did that, we combined, but even from PCA, we figured out that there is huge separation between Imperial and Mayo data. I asked them, are you using something as preservative as well? They told me they use Thymol and uh, I compare some spectra between Mayo and Imperial, and I was able to identify signals that can be attributed to time also. Then we had to eliminate uh, those signals as well. Uh, when we eliminated toluene and uh, time all, as well as urea from the data set, we saw very nice separation between uh, uh, cystinuria and other groups of patients and controls uh, in both uh, sets combined. Uh, with OPLSDA, it looks even better and we can build a very good model that can distinguish cystinuria patients from others. I think we are running out of time, so I will go through last part of my presentation very quickly, uh, which uh, is related to polycystic kidney disease. Uh, it is genetic disorder in which abnormal cysts are developing in, in kidneys over time. And this is a very comprehensive study that we started a long time ago, and it includes uh, all kinds of samples, urine, tissue extracts, plasma, uh, cell cultures developed from, from uh, kidney, polycystic kidney disease patients. And uh, in this particular project, we use Pragduli rats. Uh, we had a control group uh, and PKD, uh, genetically modified rats to develop PKD disease. Uh, these are the numbers. And in each group, uh, 
there is a subgroup that has been uh, treated with a with a specific drug, this drug is supposed to make the disease worse in PKD and shouldn't have much impact to uh, control group. Uh, so these are spectra of kidney tissue extract uh, in aromatic region. And even from here, if you look carefully, you can see that there are significant differences, particularly for aconitic acid and fumaric acid. Also, in aliphatic region, there are remarkable differences in citric acid peaks and 2-oxo-glutarate. If we apply OPLSDA on the con profile concentration using Kenomics, we can see how well they are separated. And if you combine uh, control and, and PKDs, we, we can get even better separation. And those are metabolites that, that are associated with these differences. On the top is citric acid. And you can see other TCA cycle metabolites there as well. So if we plot concentrations of TCA cycle metabolites, we can see that practically all of them have been heavily uh, increased in PKD tissue. We applied the same approach to urine samples. We were able to see the same very well separation and also uh, noticed that TCA cycle metabolites were increased. And uh, we are in, in, in process of trying to interpret this data and hopefully publish them anytime soon. Okay, uh, I apologize if I, a bit over time, but I think we still have some time for, for question section. And there are multiple people that I need to thank here for this work, including uh, Matsura, Zeng, Jaya, and Mishra from Metabolomic Score and uh, BMB department here at Mayo, then people from ne Nephrology department, and also our colleagues from Imperial College in London. And thank you to all of you for attention. I hope there's still somebody there. Yes, there are plenty of help. Thank you, Ivan. There are plenty of people still uh, working, uh, paying attention on your talk. It was a very good talk. I really enjoyed it. And we also have some questions already published at um, YouTube channel. Something like uh, seminar. Uh, at uh, Unicam, and also um, around 17 people that were seeing it on YouTube, right? So, uh, Professor Anderson Barrison, he said that he liked very much Fulano de Tau. He said, awesome, thank you. And he also wondered that the drifts in chemical shifts of foreign samples that you have measured up, uh, that they are due to the differences in pH values. And he asks if you have checked the pH. Uh, thank you for the, for the question. Yes, uh, differences in pH are one of the sources of, of drifting of chemical shift. Uh, uh, we, that's why we add buffered solution uh, in urine, but sometimes that's just not, not enough because uh, yes, the pH values of, of specific urines can differ very much and not even uh, adding a buffer can, uh, can fix that. But it's not the, the only reason the presence of uh, methyl ions there are a lot of them in, in, in urine, uh, including uh, magnesium and calcium. Their presence can also induce a lot of drifting in chemical shift. Uh, 
we can see that for some compounds, you use the same urine, you prepare it twice, you compare the spectra and you can see the, the difference. So for compounds such as citric acid that I used as an example to be addressed with this custom binning, uh, also histidine and methyl histidines, they drift so heavily that there's nothing that we can, we can do about that. Uh, no peak alignment, no uh, smart pin definitions can, can, can address this problem. So for some of them, there's virtually nothing that we can do, except if you really identify those, those peaks and measure their concentration and then uh, use some way of uh, normalizing them. So normally we don't measure pH value of the, the, the urine samples. We hope that by adding buffer, we can bring all of them around 7.4. 7 and for most of them, that would be the case. For some of them, it's outside the, the, the range and then their peaks will, will be outside of given areas. Well, thank you, Ivan. And there is another um, observation. Actually, Tasia said that she would like to congratulate you for custom binding. And it's a very clever approach. And uh, she already told me in particular that she thinks that it would be very important to publish those, um, how can I say, methodology in aligning spectra or using custom binding in for urine. It would be, it would be very important to have in the literature. Uh, glad to hear from Tasi. I hope she's doing well. I heard that she's writing her thesis and she will defend it soon. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to meet her and to, to work with her. And yes, uh, uh, I guess I'm proud to, to, to our procedure of custom binning because uh, it requires a lot of effort and uh, hopefully uh, we will soon publish the data where we, we can uh, uh, at least in supplementary, put the the bins, custom bins that we have defined for for urine, and then it can be used for uh, all the the urine related studies to people for people to help to to, to define regions and and identify components in the in the urine spectrum. Okay, then. We have another question. This one comes from uh, Bani. Uh, she said, congratulations. And she asked if you have measured samples in replicates or did you use just one sample from urine? Is it enough? Uh, that's another thing that, that uh, we are very proud of, uh, but uh, it's not... Uh, our achievement, I think it's achievement from Brooker, uh, because if you follow strictly their protocol for sample preparation and sample acquisition, then uh, reproducibility is remarkable. The only thing that can be different is that shimming is not the same, and then solvent suppression may not be uh, equally efficient in, in, in every sample. Uh, but if, if that uh, is, is achieved, then uh, spectra are virtually identical and we, we see no difference between them at all. And uh, yes, for some samples, we, we, we do them in replicates and uh, yes, they turn out to be very, very similar. But okay. when you have like 1,000 samples in, in your study, it, it, it's not uh, feasible to do replicates of, of all of them. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, we also have um, uh, Professor uh, Barrison says, thank you so much, Ivan, and have a good one. And also uh, Luba Luisic from University of Belgrade said, 
Thank you, Ivan uh, and Lubitsa for organizing such a great talk. So I think that the people from University of Belgrade enjoyed your speech. <laughs> okay, and um, I would like to ask someone from uh, the audience from the Institute of Chemistry uh, from our webinar uh, site. Is there any questions that you can raise your hand or type your question in chat? It could be even in Portuguese because I can translate to even and pass the question. Any questions? If the question is in Portuguese, I will reply in Serbian. So You can, of course. Then I can, uh, I don't know, I can uh, work as a um, public traductor uh, producing from one to another language. Okay. <laughs> okay. No questions? I have one uh, question. When you work with your ensembles, how do you control the concentrations of metabolites? Because um, urine depends on water that we drink. So uh, did you have any problems in uh, using, I don't know, same samples from the same patient, uh, all quoted in the same time, but when the person, uh, I don't know, drinks three or one liter of water per day? Okay. That's a, a great question. And I, I guess I skipped to mention that that's a very important point when you are doing urine samples. For plasma, you don't have to do any normalization because plasma itself is very well regulated by a liquid and you can compare samples directly. But for urine, that's not the case. It uh, heavily depends on hydration. So you, you need to account for that. Uh, there are multiple methods to, to address when we talk about profile concentration, the most widely used way is normalizing them to creatinine concentration. So you would profile all the concentrations and then you would normalize them to, to the value of, of creatinine in the sample itself. It's pretty simple, straightforward way, but it may not be the, the, the best one because uh, creatinine itself can be uh, affected for uh, the specific disease or whatever is the subject of your of your research uh, when we do binning we always normalize the data most of the time we use total peak area normalization again it's very simple and straightforward uh, and a lot of people uh, say that it may not be the best one, but from my experience, and we have tried uh, a lot of different ways, it's actually pretty good one. And uh, other that requires more uh, sophisticated approach, uh, it's just, you know, more effort with, uh, with not much gain. So my way uh, for normalizing would be total peak area. There's also this probabilistic coefficient uh, approach. Uh, it's very similar. So you can spare the, the, the effort and just use total peak area normalization. Well, thank you, Ivan. Um, it was great having you here. Okay. Um, I think that uh, everybody enjoyed your talk and it was very nice to see something about different kind of samples. I think that at the lab, we have never measured urine samples. We have used a lot of types of samples and biological differently and from different species even, even extracts from plants, but we have never analyzed urine because I think it's difficult to work with a good sample, okay? So you uh, proved that I'm wrong. <laughs> that urine samples are really fun to work with. Okay. <laughs> so well, thank you. Be besides they are smelly, they are they are actually not too bad to to work okay. with. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for inviting me and thank you all for for your attention and for your questions. And I hope to meet you, all of you, some of you, one day in person. Yes, you I'm have planning to, to visit come to Brazil. Brazil. 
you need to. <laughs> we will be very happy to have you here. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay. And see you.